This morning, I want to minister a message that if we can take this to heart and we can live this, not only will our lives change, our homes will change, our community will change, our cities and our nations will change. More than ever before, people are in need of love, looking for love, true love. When you watch television, you'll see that reality shows today is about love, people seeking love, relationships being restored. That's what people are looking for. Unfortunately, most people only experience love in the soul. And they never experience love that comes from the regenerated spirit of man. This love that comes from man's mind cannot change the world because it's love that's based on conditions. If you love me, I will love you. If you're kind to me, I'm going to be kind to you. The love that we need is a different kind of love. The Bible teaches us in the book of Matthew that God gives us instruction that we should love the Lord with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength and our neighbor as we love ourselves. Christianity is different than all other religions. Why? Because we are born of love. Christianity is different than all other religions because we are born of love. Love is the fruit of the Spirit. The recreated spirit of man linked up with God. Can you see the importance to be born again? Turn to the person next to you and say, you must be born again. Tell them again, say, you must be born again. The problem that we have in the church today is that there's a majority that's convinced and not converted. They're serving Jesus from here. It makes sense to serve him from here, but they're not serving Jesus from here. What is God looking for? What is God looking for? Why is it necessary for me to be born again, my wife to be born again? What is it that God wants from us? He wants godly offspring. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Malachi 2. Last book in the Old Testament. Most people, when they hear Malachi, they think about the money, Malachi 3. But I'm talking about Malachi 2, amen. So. Very interesting. Malachi is a book that's written to priests. Yes, God has called us to be a royal priesthood, but Malachi is written to priests. Malachi 2 verse 15. But did he not make them one having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. The message translation says, God, not you, made marriage. His spirit inhabits even the smallest details of marriage. And what does he want from marriage? Children of God. That's what. So God, the spirit of marriage within you, don't cheat on your spouse. God is looking for a godly offspring. He wants you to teach your children about God. What does it mean to be godly? It means to have God's ability on the inside of you. The nature of God is to love. Turn to the person next to you and say, the nature of God is to love. Why is this important? The nature of God is to love. So when you are born of love, God's ability has become your ability. And the most precious ability is to be able to forgive in the same way Christ forgave you. Ephesians 4 verse 32. As Christ has forgiven me, 
I can now forgive. Anybody got offended this week? Anybody got disappointed this week? Anybody got hurt this week? Don't raise your hand. But the Bible gives us instruction to love unconditionally. Can you see the need for the Holy Spirit in your life to help you? Saying the purpose of this marriage, godly offspring. When you go to verse 13, he's saying, you say that you love me, God. You say that you are faithful towards me, God. But you're not faithful towards your wife. You say that you love me, but you do not love your wife. How can you say you love God? You are faithful to God, whom you cannot see. If you're not faithful, if you don't love your wife in the right way. You know what this means, family? Your relationship with God depends far more on the relationship with the people around you than what you realize. A matter of fact, that's why the attack is so great upon families and upon the church. The family is the model for the church. If we get it right at home, we'll get it right at church. But if the home is weak, then the church is weak. Not a lot of amens here this morning. Family, listen to me. It's not easy to be godly. If you try and be godly on your own, it's an impossible task. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can be godly. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. We want to change this world, but we have to start by changing our homes, getting the church strong, the loving God, loving people. That's why it's been our focus from the beginning. Are you there? Ephesians 5. Verse 20, 23. Let me leave verse 22 for another day. Amen. Otherwise, I'm going to have to read from verse 17 just to put it all in perspective. Let's not touch sensitive 22. Amen. <laughs> verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason... A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Paul gives instruction here, and he says, in the same way as Jesus Christ loves the church, husbands, love your wives in the same way. It's an instruction that he gives us. The first Adam pointed the finger to Eve. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, pointed us in the direction of salvation. The first Adam disconnected himself from God when he sinned. The last Adam, Christ, reconciled himself to us. The first Adam was disobedient to the Word of God. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, became obedient to the point of death to give us a hope. This is very important to understand. This attitude should be in men of God. Amen? 
Yes. Okay, gentlemen, let's touch on this subject quickly. The Bible says, a man shall leave his father and his mother. He shall be joined to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Do you know what that means? There's a huge responsibility upon your shoulders to protect the unity. That's the husband's responsibility. This is not very difficult. The word is saying, here is Jesus Christ, here's the body of Christ. Here's a man, here's the wife. It's the way that Christ deals, works with the church is an example to us as men. He loves the church. Husbands, love your wives. Shows grace, shows mercy. Christ came to serve. In the same way as the church has an attitude towards Jesus, have that same attitude towards your husband. The church loves Jesus, honors Jesus, respects Jesus. There's a tremendous responsibility upon the shoulders of a man. Can you see that? Can you see why we need God in everything that we do? To walk in love is the highest in the spirit. A matter of fact, this union between God, man, and wife is so important. The Bible says man or the husband should protect this unity. One Peter, Peter, the rock, who God said, I'm going to build my church upon this rock and the gates of hell will not prevail. He mentions, he says that we as husbands should honor our wives as the weaker vessel so that our prayers will not be hindered. So he's saying if there's something wrong this way, it affects it this way. Your relationship with the people around you has a bigger impact upon your relationship with God than what you realize. When he says, honor them as the weaker vessel, he's not saying she's weaker than you because we know Adam in Genesis said, she's bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. He acknowledged her as his equal. That weaker vessel is better described as as a finer porcelain. If you have to think about coffee and tea, Some of you like coffee, some of you like tea, but coffee, gentlemen might drink it in a big mug. Thick, hard-baked, you can hit it, you can drop it, and it's not going to break. Have you got one of those at home? But the fine porcelain, you just bump it and it chips. That's her. That's why you have to be careful with her. And Jesus knows that. That's why when he works and he deals with us, it's with grace. He says, I want a godly man a godly woman, so that they can be godly offspring. When your children come to you, Father, and they say, Daddy, how much does God the Father love me? Your response should be, He loves you as much as He loves Jesus. As much as He loves the Son of God, Jesus Christ, He loves you in the same way as one of His sons. Don't let them just hear it. Let them see it. We all make mistakes. Amen? Turn to the person next to you and say, everybody makes mistakes. Yes, I know. I counsel a lot of people. I know people make mistakes. I'm a pastor. I make mistakes. I sometimes miss it as well. Amen? I hope you are praying for your pastor as well. I need your prayers like you need my prayers. Can you see why we need a generation of men that are converted, women that are converted, that are born from above, whose spirits have been regenerated and has linked up with God? 1 Corinthians 6, 17, he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. We need the love of God to work in us, through us, so that we can have godly offspring. 
That's why as a believer, you cannot be unequally yoked because then there won't be godly offspring. When you are born again, you have the ability to love like Jesus loves. But when somebody is not born again, they can only love with their mind. They can only love conditionally. The truth is, we are at our best in an atmosphere of love. Children perform better when they experience love. We feel stronger, we feel healthier when there is love. Amen? Children, that's the fruit of our love. The truth is every love act enriches us, empowers us, strengthens us. We should first love. We should first love before we serve. God first loved, then he gave Jesus. For God so loved the world, then he gave. Before we serve our community here, ask yourself the question, do you love this community? Before we want to go serve our nation, ask yourself, do I love this nation? Galatians teaches us, Galatians 5 says, we've been called to liberty, but don't use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Not serve one another to show love, through love serve one another. God so loved that he gave. There can be no loving if you love, truly love God, and you're in love with Jesus, serving comes naturally. Because now the greatest servant lives on the inside of you. When you truly love, giving comes naturally. You can give without loving. You can serve without loving. But if you love, you'll automatically serve. If you love, you'll automatically give. When serving becomes a burden, wanting to help people, go check your love. Go check your love, number one. You might be offended either with God or with some people around you. The truth is, when we come to church, nobody's perfect. People come with different expectations. So it's very easy to take offense. That's why we have to give love because we need love. Show grace because we need grace. Jesus did not come to be served. He came to serve. He became the greatest servant. The decision that he made to lay down his life. When you are linked up with love, a matter of fact, when we keep ourselves in love, it's not so easy to make a mistake or sin. Even as Christians, it's when we step out of love that we say the wrong things, do the th wrong things. Can you see the need to ask God to act in you that our words will be filled with love, our deeds will be filled with love? You have to protect your heart not to become bitter. Listen to the things that you are saying. If you're in a relationship, you are married, you, you need your wife to be able to speak into your life when you are defiling people. If you are saying things about people that are breaking them down, it's not coming from a heart of love because love covers a multitude of sins. We're not here to nail each other, to judge each other, but we're here to help each other. Hebrews 12 teaches us that we should be careful lest we fall short of the grace of God and a root of bitterness springs up. And this root of bitterness defiles many people. So when you are defiling people, your heart is snitching on you that there's a root of bitterness busy growing. Are you saying I'm bitter? I'm not saying you're bitter. I'm saying the Bible says if you defile Go check your heart for bitterness. Go check your heart for offense. Turn to the person next to you and say, Aina. 
because it's so easy to criticize and we cannot improve a situation by criticizing it. Love has a different language. Turn to the person next to you and say, love has a different language. Family, it's easy to judge people from your strengths. It's easy. And we usually judge people from our own strengths. But the truth is that person that you are judging, he's got strengths that you don't have. And he can probably judge you as well. But we're not here to judge each other. We're here to act love. When you serve, are you serving from your head or from your heart? Even when you are giving, are you giving from here or from here? Remember, what God values most about you is beyond human comprehension. Because in our hearts, we are made to be like God. So humility is not something you do, something that you act. It's who you've become because of your total dependence upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Serving is not just something you do, it's who you've become because the greatest servant lives on the inside of you. Holiness is not something that we do trying to be holier than thou. It's who we've become because he who knew no sin became sin so that we can become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Can you see the importance to act love? Sometimes even when you're in a difficult situation and you don't know what to do, let love lead. Love will show the way. Love will give the answer. Turn with me to 1 Kings 3. Let me go show you something there. Go and read it from verse 16 right to the end. It's the story about two harlots that both had children, stayed in the same home. The one had a baby. Three days later, the other woman had a baby. Tragic thing happened. The one baby died. So the mother swapped the baby. She took her baby, dead baby, gave it to the other mother and took the, the baby that was alive. So they went to King Solomon and he said, okay, what's going on here? They explained their whole situation. They're alone. This is what happened. Solomon says, okay, this is very easy. Bring a sword. I'm going to cut this baby in half. The mother, whose child it was, said, no, 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 please don't kill the baby. Rather take the child and give it to her. And the mother, whose baby had died, she was prepared to kill that child. We see this story about the love of a mother. But I want to take it a little bit back further. Both these women, the Bible mentioned specifically that they were harlots, mentioned that they had children, the fathers are not mentioned. In those days, if you had a child and you didn't have a husband, shame was, great shame was upon you. So here I want to commend both these mothers that the fear of the shame was conquered by love. Both of them could have said, well, this child can interfere with my career. But they didn't. I think there's something in these mothers where they chose their children above their careers that we can commend. And then the last mother that chose the best for the child. Chose the best for the child. I think the one thing that we can see here I want to talk to the young people. I want to talk to parents as well here. This teaches us that many times our parents have a background of a lifestyle that was not right, a shady background, maybe something that you would not approve of. But having said all of that, your mother still had you. And you have Jesus now. And you can make a decision to be born of love, not to judge, but to forgive and to break that cycle of a background of things that were not right. Whether it's abuse, whatever, there's so many things going on in this world that's difficult for parents. Why am I saying this? Because Jesus does not consult your past in determining your good future. When you accept him, your past is over. 
a matter of fact, 2 Corinthians teaches us that it's the love of God that compels us. Family, we can break that cycle of hatred, of bitterness, of unforgiveness. When you accept the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ, this salvation is not based upon what you've done right, but what Jesus did right. So the only condition is to accept what Jesus did on the cross. And the worst of sins can be forgiven. A matter of fact, when you go look at the lineage of Jesus, there were a lot of shady characters in that lineage. They were deceivers. They were prostitutes. They were murderers. Just to mention a few. But Christ died for us to say, you know what? I'm not going to consider your past in determining your good future. I think one of the things in our nation right now that we have to consider and take very seriously that there's an attack against the church not to love the way that we should love. Let me say this, that any racial discrimination is a trap of the enemy to hinder you to receive the love of God. Did you hear what I said? I said, any racial discrimination, it's a trap of the enemy to hinder you to experience the love of God. You cannot be born again and be a racist because you are born of love. Do you know what is the saddest thing? Is that God loves everybody. The worst of sinners, Jesus loves them. And the person that's lived the best life, Jesus loves them. But you know what? One day, when everything is all over, every person is going to look Jesus in the eyes. And they're going to know that God loves them unconditionally. They're going to be aware of it. They're going to know that they could have experienced that love, lived in that love. But because they rejected Jesus, He will say, depart from me. And that will be the greatest torment to live without that love, knowing that it was available and it was there. Christians, listen to me. We've got no right not to forgive. God does not consider your past in determining your good future. A matter of fact, Mary Magdalene, we know for sure that seven demons were cast out of her. Many people believe that she was the same woman that washed Jesus' feet, who was also a prostitute. There's no clear reference in Scripture when I look at that, but it doesn't matter. She was a woman that was labeled a sinner or somebody who had demons. But yet, after she was forgiven, the person who is forgiven of much loves much. But when you think, ah, oh, what I do, it's not really wrong. That's the way that you repent. That's the way that you love. It was this Mary who got the instruction from Jesus. Think about this. What a serious message. The whole gospel is based on the fact that Jesus is alive today. Who received the message to go tell it to the disciples? You would think it would be Paul or Peter or something. No. This woman, go tell my disciples, I'm alive. Love is alive. Hope to all of us. She's the one who has forgiven much, who loved much. Jesus will never reveal himself to somebody that is not in love with him. If you love God, if you love God, he will reveal himself to you. Family, listen to me. When people have wronged you, we don't forgive so that they should forgive us. We forgive because there's an eternal life. Christians, listen to me here. Hebrews teaches us that they did not enter into the promised land. Why? Because of faith, because of unbelief, they could not enter into the promised land. 
type of heaven because of unbelief. We as Christians here today, there's two kinds of faith, like there's two kinds of love. There's a faith that comes from here, and there's a faith that comes from here. Have you ever wondered why people will come and say, but I casted out demons, I prophesied, I did all these great things, and Jesus will say, I don't know you, depart from me. Because those people exercised faith. They applied the principles. The Word of God works. If you plant a seed, whether you, whatever religion or a Christian, it's still going to grow. The principle is there. But the thing that pleases God is faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And this faith, Galatians 5 teaches us, must work through love. So Christianity is not about focusing on what you've been saved from, but what you've been saved into. So we forgive because of eternity. Because if we don't forgive, we cannot be forgiven. So let me help some of you. Because in this forgiveness walk, I've seen many Christians offend people even more. Is it okay? Can I help you and just give you some advice in this love walk? Because some of you have been forgiving over and over and over and over, and your heart is getting heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier. Let me see your hand if I'm talking to the right people here. Just be honest. So I'm going to tell you why. Because we read this Bible, and we change it to suit ourselves so that we should feel better instead of allowing this word to change us. So number one, forgiveness is important, not so that the other person should forgive you, but because of eternity, because of salvation. So number one, David, when he sinned, he said, Lord, I've sinned against you and you alone. Wash me, cleanse me, create in me a pure heart. So let's say somebody has committed the worst sin against you. Or you've had a disagreement, husbands and wives, you had a disagreement. He said something ugly, you said something ugly back. He said something worse, you said something. And at the end of the day, the mistake that we make is we sit and we think, okay, let's judge this. He was 80% wrong and I was 20% wrong. Have you ever done that? Raise your hand quickly if you've ever done that. Just be honest. Biggest mistake that you've made. Trap of the enemy. If you engage both parties, 100% guilty. If you've engaged, 100% guilty. So number one, it's not about the other person, it's about you. So let me talk to men. So first go to God. First go to God and say, God, I have sinned. I take responsibility. Forgive me. All sin that we commit is against God. I've sinned against you and you alone. David said, my sin is ever before me. Lord, forgive me. Wash me with your blood and sanctify me. Now you are forgiven. Paul said, as Christ has forgiven me, I forgive you. Step number one. Because there's no condemnation. If your heart is condemning you, 1 John 3, God is greater than your heart. Get the peace back. God is forgiven. Now, God, I'm still angry with this person. Christ, as you have forgiven me, I am going to forgive them. How long does that period time take to do that? Well, it's very simple. The Bible says, don't let the sun go down. So you've got until the sun goes down to sort it out. This, I'm working through it. I'm going to think about it. If you keep that thing in your heart for a month, and that has become your pattern and your habit from childhood, you've hardened your heart. You've probably got a heart that's got a thick callus. Ain't Because if you leave that thing, sin in your heart, it will damage your heart. And that's why it's hurting you. All that's happening, your heart is getting harder and harder. Your walls are getting thicker and thicker. So you need to get to a place where you say, Lord, forgive me, and I forgive the person. It's a decision. How would you feel if you come to Jesus and you say, I messed up, I lost my temper again. And Jesus said, mm, okay, 
This is now the 30th time. So come back in 30 days. How are you going to feel? That's not the nature of Jesus. That's the nature of man. It's a decision. That's why we should ask God. So after you've asked God to forgive you, and you forgive the person that has hurt you or wronged you or harmed you or offended you, now you can go to the person. You don't go to the person. Do you truly believe that you have forgiven them already when you go to them? If you truly believe that, then you don't have to walk up to them and say, you know that stupid thing that you did that I told you you shouldn't do, that I warned you and I reminded you of, but you didn't listen, just to mention it again, I'm going to be the good Christian and forgive you. If you do that, you're offending them again. You're not helping the matter. If you have truly forgiven them before you go to them, then all you have to say is, please forgive me. Please forgive me. I was wrong. Whether they respond or not does not affect you in any way because you have forgiven them. But man's nature is, I've said sorry. Why don't you say sorry? Don't raise your hand. God sees your heart. You know what I'm talking about. Because we're doing it from here and not from here. So if we want to be Christians born from above to walk in forgiveness, you need the help of the Holy Spirit. Because number one, you can say no to sin, but you'll not be able to say yes to righteousness without the help of the Holy Spirit. And as Christ has forgiven me, I can now forgive. Have I helped some of you? Some of you will have to go and just ask for forgiveness again. Don't go to, sometimes we go to people and we say, I forgive you for taking my parking. And the guy think, who are you? I don't even know it was your parking. You're just upsetting the person, disturbing the peace. It's about love. Jesus said, by this, they will know that you are my disciples, by the love that you have for one another. When Jesus called Peter, he didn't say, Peter, you are the rock. I'm going to build my church upon you. Go and serve my people. Go look after my sheep. No, he didn't do that. He said, Peter, do you love me more than these? The requirement for Christian ministry is do you love God? And when you love God, that love will overflow to others. Can you see the need to say, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon me? Fill my heart with your love until it overflows to others. Let me close with this. I know you have a lot to think about, but it's very important to see people, to look at people through the eyes of love. Love covers a multitude of sin. Love is kind. Love is gentle. Love is patient. Let people say, household of Christ, loving God, loving people, is not just written against the wall, but those people love God and they love people. See you later.